Well, welcome back to Truths from the Text. This is episode 18 and the third installment in our discussion of relative names. So we've covered quite a bit of ground thus far. We started uh, many episodes ago talking about negative names, removing things from God. Then we talked about certain positive names or simple perfections that we can say about God. And then we spent a good amount of time on metaphors. Uh, lots of, there's lots of metaphors in scripture. And now we've turned to a whole new uh, category of naming, which are relations. And this is all setting us up towards being able to talk about Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the real relations in God. But before we get to talking about the Holy Trinity, we're trying to prepare ourselves mentally for that great task and relative names is something I was never, ever taught. And uh, you know, having read many systematic theologies, never really uh, was even taught as a separate category. So uh, this is where Ryan's been helping us understand what is a relation, what's a relationship, how do we understand this when we're talking about the God-creation relationship. So that's where we are. And today we're going to do a little bit of uh, review and hopefully uh, move things forward a little bit. So Ryan, I'll hand it off to you to start us wherever you would like to start us. Yeah, so I do want to do a little bit of a sit and spin and concentrate on one or two of the points that we focused on last time, uh, especially that relations cue off of each other and that in the case of the God world relation uh, relationship, uh, his relations to us arise from ours to him. Um, that former point that relations cue off of each other is really central uh, when we get to the doctrine of the Trinity, just to preview that maybe a moment. Um, it's behind uh, the logic of actually having four relations in God, even though only three persons, of course. We have the relation of father to son, of son to father, okay, that's two relations, one relationship. But then we have the relation of father and son to the Holy Spirit and the relation of the Holy Spirit to father and son. So that's four relations. Well, it takes two to tango. Remember our golden rule of relative names. Uh, and how these relations cue off of each other is uh, super central, not just for why we end up with four relations, even though only three persons, but is behind the logic of why Christ, uh, as Thomas says, uh, is the name of the whole Trinity, by which Thomas means when you know Christ, uh, particularly as son of the Father, out of that arises the entire doctrine of the Trinity. We can derive from the name Christ because from Christ's relation of sonship to the father, uh, relations cue off each other, out pops the father's relation to Christ, and so on and so forth down the line. So this idea of relations cueing uh, becomes especially important later. Uh, in the case of the God-world relationship, though, this idea of his relations to us arising from ours to him. Um, we want to give a little bit of Further examples on this, dive a little bit deeper into the relative names we've already mentioned before, mainly to just illustrate this point, because it's a bit contrary to how we natively or frequently think. Um, we, we like to do a very top down, uh, you know, God's relation to us, and then we are related to him. And that, of course, is, is true and is important, but nonetheless, ontologically, or when we go out there and look at the real world, uh, on which our thoughts are grounded, it's also an important uh, 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 moment to recognize that this relationship that God has erected by virtue of creating us um, has important, in important ways, uh, its grounds upon firstly, our relation, uh, and then secondly, God's relation to us. So it's vice versa for important reasons. And I want to, first of all, circle back to the famous text that medievals like to handle in this context that I mentioned last time. It's from Psalm 91, uh, Psalm 90, verse 1. 
Lord, you have been made a refuge for us. This is the locus classicus, the classic commonplace text that medievals stop. They like to talk about relative names and also this issue of God acquiring new relations and then by derivation, losing uh, old relations or having old relations fall away. And indeed, we see both issues here. One is just the relations issue. We are sheltered by God and he shelters us. But especially focused in this text is the newness of the relationship as a whole that both parties acquire. Before, we were not sheltered, and now God shelters us. Okay, how do we deal with this very common scenario uh, that we face all over the place? Well, we noted last time that it involves gaining new relations, but losing others as well. It goes for both, both ways. And that the fundamental logic here is that you need only one of the parties to change in order to change the whole situation, so to speak. So Thomas, De Potentia Q788, add five, response to the objection number five, you can look this up, says that in order for something to gain a new relation, it's not necessary for him himself to undergo change so long as one of the persons involved experiences change. Picture here a dog running around his doghouse with his leash. I used to have a golden retriever growing up, and it was very funny because the doghouse, he had a length of leash that was just so long, and we lived in a place where there were lots of trees, and the squirrels were very mean, and they would camp out literally. I'm not, it was just remarkable, right on the very edge of where uh, my dog, his name was Champ could run. And so he would wear this path in the ground all the way around the doghouse, just this well-worn path chasing squirrels and, and uh, clotheslining himself as he goes after them. It was quite remarkable. But if you picture that as the dog runs around the doghouse, the relationship that's represented here by his leash is changing as a whole. And the relationship here, of course, includes both relations. But the relationship changes only by virtue of the dog that's changing, running around, not anything to do with the doghouse, which is solid in the ground. It's why only the dog wears the line in the grass deeper, 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 that the, uh, you know, nothing happens to the doghouse in the center. The dog is the one changing the situation and as he goes around the doghouse, the relations in the doghouse to the dog are keeping up, even though nothing is going on with the doghouse. Okay. This idea, very important. It's the same case with God and us. Now, God is not inert like a doghouse, but he stands at the center of our solar system, so to speak, and we orbit constantly around him. So in our orbit, as change accrues for us, God also is said to change. As we gain relations, so also God. As we lose relations or acquire others, so likewise him. This is the way it goes and the underlying logic that we need to keep track of. God's relations arise from our relations to him. So this verse, Lord, you are now made a refuge in relation to us, i.e. before you weren't, now you are, is true and comes about because we have finally placed ourselves underneath his shelter and taken refuge in him. This change in us grounds, firstly, our new relation to him, and therefore, secondly, his new relation to us. All right. Um, Aaron, any thoughts on that or additions helps for us? Uh, do you want to say anything about the real rational using the dog doghouse analogy yet? Or do you want to get to that 
a little bit later. Um, we can talk about that in 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 a minute. Uh, yeah, the the issue of the real rational uh, is probably helped by that by that illustration. Uh, for me, I'm just focusing on this this idea of the dog changing the status quo, whereas the doghouse is is, is sitting there. Um, that's kind of the underlying logic um, behind the God world relations. Yeah, I was thinking about you know in uh, in junior high, if you have a uh, a junior high girlfriend or boyfriend, you know uh, you've got that relationship, but but both parties have the power to terminate that relationship. <laughs> Yes. At, at any time. And, and uh, that is yes. the nature of relationships. As you said earlier, it takes two uh, to tango. And it also just takes one to change the relation. Yeah. 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 Much to our frequent sorrow. Uh, you know, the, the great part about the God world relationship is that God never unfriends us. There's no God never unfriends us on Facebook. God never changes on his side of the equation, his relationship to us. Um, we're the only ones holding back the relationship and its intensity uh, that we can have with God. Um, God is always open armed. Yeah. All right, well, let's move on to this idea then of relations and the issue of real versus rational relations. And we've talked about this several times in different ways. I've mentioned to you the fact that we're speaking here very much against colloquial norms. It's not how we talk in everyday person language. Uh, and if you think in terms of everyday person language, you're going to be confused and misled as to what these kinds of claims amount to. Uh, again, God is not inert like a doghouse. God is not... Um, you know, just imaginarily related to us or something like that. Um, the, the, the realness of his relation to us is just as real and more as you want it to be. Do not become confused when we start to get into the technicals. But still, from what we've seen, uh, especially this idea of God's relations to us arising from our relations to him, everything, at least in a certain way, hinges on our side of the equation. And if we meet sufficient conditions to ground the relationship, uh, God just enters into the other side of that relationship, so to speak, automatically. It's for this reason that Thomas will even sometimes say that God's relative names signify not so much the relation of God to us, as much as the relation of us to God. So the relation creator, uh, we like to think of it perhaps uh, as something in God. Of course, we know relations are not a something, but merely a towards something. It's very important. But we like to think of this God is creator as signifying something about God, something of this sort. Thomas says, well, it's true in a sense. It's important. But it's better if you start off on the right foot and think of what's grounding this relation, what's, uh, what's founding it, what's establishing it, where, where everything is hinging uh, as our relation to God. So in his book of the sentences, book one, distinction nine, he says, quote, the relation how God is said relatively to the creature is not real, really in God himself, but really in the creature itself, which is changed. This is the idea of the dog, the doghouse changing that I just mentioned above. So this is true. It's important to get off on the right foot here. Um, it can also be a bit confusing, though. The point that, that Thomas is trying to make is that the reality at stake is ours. The change is ours. The real relation is ours. The gravitational pull of this naming, so to speak, is on our side. So much so that we can even say God is creator just signifies our being creatures. It's all it means. God is Lord. We are subject. Things of this sort. Nonetheless, Thomas notes that although 
our side is where the reality of the relationship is founded as a whole. Nonetheless, our ideas of the respective relations slot into either party. And this is where God's relation, we especially say, is rational, rational. So we grasp the real relation of creature to God, and God's relation arises to meet it co, uh, co uh, understood in our mind, as Thomas says, or Aristotle simultaneously in our thought process. But that relation that we quote unquote place into God in our minds has its ground in our head, which is ultimately grounded on real created being. So the mind is not imagining things or, you know, just dealing with mist, uh, something along those lines. But the realness is found in creatures. The rationalness is in our head. And for this reason, a God's relation is said to be only rational. So listen to this quotation. This is, this is helpful. Thomas says, when we say that a certain creator is a servant, then through this idea, we import a certain relation found in the creature really existing. Okay. Then, Thomas says, it happens that we posit the opposed relation somewhere. So we're thinking about this. We have to place the other relation somewhere. And he says, we don't place this other relation that arises in our mind because relations are simultaneous. We don't place this relation in the creature because then the creature would be Lord of its own self. And that's not what we mean, but rather we place it in God as we understand him to terminate or to be the target of creatures relation to him. So we place the relation that co arises in our mind from our understanding of the real dependence of a creature upon God. We place that into God and we therefore name God because we name things insofar as we know them. That's another golden rule of Thomas theology. We do not name something except insofar as we know it. And the mode how we know it is the mode how we name it. Okay. Thoughts here, Aaron, on this real rational topic? Yeah, I think um, it's important to remember that things are real in different ways. And one of the ways you could think of the way that we in like common speech talk about this is mad something just being imaginary. So like, uh, I have a pet rock. Well, that's an imaginary, everyone knows that's an imaginary relationship. You, you befriended a rock. Okay. Hmm. Um, and, uh, we would say, yeah, I guess that's a real relationship only in your head. It's only in your head. And then when we're talking about say a relationship between, you and your parents or you and an actual human being, everyone knows, well, that actually is real in two senses, two senses. Mm -hmm. It's really in your head that you have a relationship with Bob or Joe or your mom or dad or whoever, but also you can verify it in outside of your head. Mm -hmm. It's something real for both creatures. And uh, I think, just remembering those different ways in which something can be real is going to really help you, especially when you get to doing Trinitarian relations. Yeah. But it does take some thought to just think about what you're, uh, what you're apprehending. Yeah. So the, um, w once you realize, um, the, your relationship, to God, the relationship itself is a, is a very real relationship. Um, it's verified. Yes, it's in your head that you have a relationship with God, of course, but also we're verifying it outside of your head that mm. uh, you're here, aren't you? Therefore, someone really uh, created you. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, that's all I wanted to say. <laughs> yeah, that's good. And uh, yeah, the. It, this is where kind of the bottom up approach of Thomas starting down here, our relation, you know, we exist. Okay. 
now we're related to God. Now God is related to us helps illustrate what, what we mean here. Um, we have an idea in our head of a relationship as a whole, the two relations that all of this is grounded upon the reality as such, the God world situation. Um, but God and creatures are not the same sort of thing. Um, God is not something that needs to be strapped uh, into his relationship. God is not something that needs to, uh, in order to abide in this relationship, needs to acquire some good for himself. No, God is the, the, the perfect source of goodness and infinite love that just pours out. He is altogether pouring out towards us and we're just receiving from him. God doesn't receive back again. So the relationship as a whole is slightly different. I'm just always wary that, you know, you're absolutely right. We think of our imaginary relationship to our pet rock or our relationship to our parents, which is verified on both sides of the equation. Yes, but then we get to God and we're like, oh, it's not verified in the case of God. We can easily imagine this as impoverishing our relationship with God or hearing that our relationship with God only means something to us and not to God, or that somehow it's hollowed out or deteriorated. And that's not what's being said. Uh, it's, it's somewhat the opposite because the whole rationale behind uh, removing a real foundation on the side of God, change, needing to acquire better good, dependency and all of that, uh, is because he's more, not less, and therefore he's a, can I say, a better relational partner than we could ever hope to have. So don't hear by real relationship to your parents happen, happens or matters to both sides of the equation. Yes, all that's true and important. Uh, throw one side away and we get to the God relationship. Yes, but also strongly, no. So just beware and be careful. Um, it's, it's easy when you start doing some of these technical theology moves to derive false, very, very false and soul destroying ideas. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think it's helpful to think about the order of like uh, in the order of being your relationship with a inanimate object is what it is because it's a relationship to an inanimate object, right? Mm -hmm. It's, it's just in your head. Whereas yeah. uh, God is anything but an inanimate object. Yeah. And therefore, if anything, we're more like the rock in this, in this yeah. scenario than yeah, that's the other way point. around. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Where do you want to go from here? Um, so I just want to uh, uh, ping just a little bit more, uh, some of the difference of our relative names set of God that we've alluded to a few times, we're kind of circling around part of it is because it's a little bit difficult, a little bit confusing also for me, I'll be honest. Uh, but something of the difference between relative names like Lord versus relative names like creator. Thomas makes a big deal about this and it involves at least in part the idea of what are the conditions for establishing or grounding a relationship as a whole? I think I used last time, uh, you know, there are different factors or different contexts for using the word mom or talking about different relations signified by the word mom. It's kind of similar to that here. So think about different conditions. For example, for this name, Lord, signifying the relation lordship, what is required for uh, this name uh, to be had and to signify something real. Well, Thomas pulling from Boethius and Dionysius who define Lord as uh, Lordship, excuse me, they define Lordship as power for coercing subjects. Uh, this is where Thomas is pulling this definition of Lordship from. Thomas will emphasize the fact that the resources or the goods, uh, the that are founding this relationship are God and all of God's stuff. So Thomas says, both the resources for Dionysius and the power for Boethius are required for somebody to be Lord. And upon these two 
things, resources, and power or strength is founded the relation lordship. So he's talking about among creatures and he's going to take that into God where God has all of his goods, all the wealth and inner resources of God and also his power. And so in the case of God, this name Lord signifies that relation, which is founded upon his goods and especially his power. Now, you know, because you're careful about relations and you know it takes two to tango, that in order for somebody to actually be Lord, there has to be somebody else subject. And it's kind of just the condition for this relationship. But although that's true and important, and in fact, we're even making a big deal about it, it's more the mere fact of their just being there, just being somebody. It's not so much something in them or something about them that's in view when we talk about this relation, Lord. Rather, what's in view is something to do, in this case, with God or he who is Lord, rather than he who is subject. So this is why Thomas, in his quadlibital 9Q2A3 add 1, says, God really is Lord of creature, although in him lordship is not a real relation, because he is said to be really Lord on account of his real power, which is the foundation therein. This is um, behind the fact that even when a creature doesn't yet exist, and where this name isn't signifying anything uh, yet, any idea of relation in God, because there's no creature to ground that thought. Uh, even behind that, God has the sufficient conditions or the sufficiency in himself to become Lord, should there be, should there come, should there arise the mere fact of a creature rising to, to face him, so to speak. Um, all he needs is for there to be a creature, and he is Lord thereof because of his inner resources and power. Okay. By contrast to that, is a relation more like creator? Now, it too, of course, requires that there's somebody else to which God is related. But beyond this, it also includes as its condition the divine act which makes such to be. So the creaturely receipt or, um, you know, grabbing hold of being as a gift from God is an important and even, you might say, essential condition for establishing this relationship. Whereas in the case like the name Lord, nothing about the creature was really required. Uh, it was all about the creator, or I shouldn't say creator, because now we're getting confused. It's all about God and only God, which is in view. This is why these pattern somewhat differently and why I've alerted you to the fact that we can speak of relations that are founded upon simple perfections, relations like Lord, other examples would be governor and king, which are founded upon something real in the divine essence, usually some simple perfection. So Lord is founded upon power or strength. Whereas there's other relations that arise from the creaturely receipts of God's works actions of God, these are creator, savior, and so on, that are founded upon something real among creatures. The others are real in God. These are especially real among creatures, the real passions or re receptions of being, uh, being created, being saved, and so on. These relations we want to describe as merely or purely temporal. In contrast to relations like Lord, which, although they also are temporal and contingent, nonetheless, according to their foundation, actual power in God, we want to sometimes speak of them as somewhat eternal. So God, before and behind, he creates the world, before any creature comes to be, is still Lord by virtue of his power in a, an important sense in theology. Whereas he's not really in any sense creator before and behind something grabs hold of being and a creature uh, comes to be. So there's a lot of strings going on here, uh, some technicality, but if you just think in terms of differing grounds or conditions for erecting a relationship, 
um, that should help you um, at least recognize that these are going to pattern slightly differently. And sometimes those differences might be important. Ryan, could you say something about refuge and where it would fit on that kind of spectrum between saying God is Lord, God is creator? Would refuge be more like Lord in that as soon as there's someone to take refuge, it's founded upon uh, what is it? What is the foundation in God for something like refuge? Um, or would it be more like creator where it's just talking about um, kind of an, an action? That's a really good question. Um, I could go either way with that. I'd have to think about it. My first instinct was to say, well, it patterns more like Lord. Uh, because as soon as we open up our arms to God, uh, he just is taking us into him. But I think maybe it patterns a bit more akin to creator and savior and things of this sort. Because those names especially involve something happening among creatures. Our being saved um, our decision of will to place our place our trust in him, things of this sort. And it would seem to me that God being our refuge, or God being our shelter, depending on what word we want to use here, is going to be more along that line. Because the precondition, and this is really in focus on the issue of change, the precondition is our humble acquiescence uh, and reliance uh, upon something in God. It's not exactly a passion so much, um, which is why I'm a little hesitant, but it's really, really important to focus upon the thing in us that's grounding and starting uh, this relationship. Um, so I'd have to think a little bit more about this. Uh, I could go either way. Hmm. Yeah, I think that helps illustrate uh, that it uh, it does take quite a bit of work to think about, like uh, uh, if words are the signs of our, you know, intentions of our mind, the passions, it's like you really have to think clearly about like, what am I intending in saying that God is my refuge? Yeah. Or so in, in the KJV dwelling place, well, yeah. Already, you know, because you, you remember the Maimonides episode, <laughs> well, we've got metaphorical names, we've got the relational yep. aspect, and then we've got a foundation we got to look at. There's a lot of different aspects to uh, divine naming. And when you start reading scripture, well, they're going to pop up all over the place. If yep. uh, So to take, um, uh, so to exercise my, my mind on this. So for Savior, so I know it's supposed to slot more like creator. Mm -hmm. So the pattern I would want to go through is I'm recognizing uh, I have been saved or in being saved, someone has saved me. I'm the recipient. I'm on the receiving end of God's divine action of saving. Yeah. And so that's kind of the sliver of reality that mm -hmm. I'm conceiving of or thinking about. And therefore, uh, I know that I wasn't saved by myself, so I posit save. I put savior to God. Mm. That's the re that's the relation. Yeah. Um, so I'm thinking about the action I received, or I was acted upon in this mm -hmm. way, and then I run it back up into yeah. God. Are there any other uh, frequent or common names that slot more like Lord um, that we could illustrate for folks? I mean, there, there are relations that are important, but a little more technical. Uh, God knows us. It's a relation. Why is it a relation? God's knowledge of us. Well, because uh, we are the object that God is knowing. Um, God loves us. Also a relation. There's, there's a lot that's going on. 
And those are different. Those are different than than Lord. So don't get confused. The relations, there are a lot of sorts of relations. Okay. Um, as far as similar ones to Lord. A lot of them would be kind of synonyms to Lord, like master, king, um, God. Would, would, God would, like, is- would governor and sustainer be more in the Lord category or would that be more in the creator category? I would slot them more in the Lord category. Um, but I had to think about it now. Um, God is also a relative name in certain cases, depending on what you mean. Uh, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of little secret relations going on out there that, might be important to think about, get really into the weeds. Um, you know, one of the one of the issues or challenges that come in with relative names is that they're so narrow, but simultaneously they also involve a number of factors. Like the name creator, as an example. Well, it's this little itty bitty pointer finger in God that's aiming towards us. Okay. <laughs> and then we do all this headache of, well, it's founded upon our reception of divine being. And of course, it arises in our mind is the real relation of creature and dependence upon God. Okay. People then become tempted to use the name or the word creators like an overarching chapter header to talk about a lot of stuff that's tangentially related or even more immediately or approximately related. And then this word creator starts to mean something entirely different than like a scholastic, which is okay. Like we use words to mean different things, to talk about different realities. Okay, we can do that. Um, but there's a real temptation to do that with relative names because they're very small. They involve a number of things and people think they're too small and they need to have more stuff involved and they become chapter, chapter headers or something like this. You stuff a lot of stuff under them. Um, you know, one of the virtues of scholastic theology, which also makes it difficult, is it's extremely narrow and precise. Um, it also limits its payoff and its applicability. Uh, the upside is that you're actually speaking truth and knowing reality. So I'll just leave that there. I don't mean to be too aggressive here, but... It's a, a cost to pay, but sometimes that price is worth it. And uh, there does come a, a, come a time as well when you have mastered enough scholastic theology, enough of the super hyper technical is that you can zoom out and you can work at a general level. And your general level is still, even though it's general, spot on because you've lasered down into all the particulars and it's the general of the actual particulars rather than just a fuzzy portrait of some of the stuff that might be there. And of course it includes some of the stuff that's not there. So those are two very different ways of doing theology at a general level. And a lot of general theology today is it's just fuzzy rather than somebody who knows and is abstracted. Those are different things. Um, so yeah, there's a place for general, good general theology. I don't want to dissuade people from it. Anyway, I'm going to get off my hobby horse now and pass it back over to you. Yeah. Uh, when there are prepositions, there are going to be relations and yeah. you can't talk without using some kind of prepositions. And um, you start realizing, uh, like we said before, relations are, are everywhere. Even some of these names that <clears throat> we've treated already under uh, uh, different categories of names, like positive names, there's a relational aspect to them, or you can, um, de- yeah, depending on what is intended, like, like the name God, it's like, well, first you got to ask, remember, uh, God can be said in many modes. Uh, we need to say, well, w- what is our actual predicate? Mm-hmm. What is our actual predicate that is being signified in this text or by this mm-hmm. author? And then you might find that over here, God is being used or translated as a proper name, whereas mm-hmm. in another place, 
it has just a relative aspect to it. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, it gets, it gets more complicated, uh, (laughs) when you start really looking closely at the text and, and trying to understand. So hence the name of the, the, the show is truths from the text. We're trying to, we're trying to speak truth, uh, and, and, uh, engage with reality uh, Mm -hmm. as best we can, but also it can be tedious at times. Um, Ryan, I wanted to try to close by, um, setting us up for Trinity. So not going into Trinity stuff, but um, some maybe closing thoughts on relations, because I do think people, if, if it's still a little fuzzy for people, I think as soon as we get to Trinity, this is going to actually become a lot more clear because you're going to have to make some really important distinctions in your mind so that you don't become a heretic or an area. But um, are there any kind of closing thoughts as we're setting the stage for Trinity on just saying relations of God? I think if you just remember the proper formality or the unique definition of relation as towards something, rather than an absolute, which interiorly defines the subject, and then secondly, that relations come in pairs, takes two to tango, which includes this idea of queuing. Really, those two ideas are going to be about all the metaphysics or philosophy you need uh, in order to do the doctrine of the Holy Trinity. And keep in mind as well, important. When we come to the doctrine of Holy Trinity, we are now coming to a place where we are altogether students and recipients of God's word. We're not coming with a philosophical category so much as noticing that the names that God has given us to say, like father, son, and so on, are relative names. And because they're relative names and this is what relations do, out pops the Trinity. So we know God is a Trinity only because God tells us so. This is not something we know from natural reason, something that be derived philosophically. There's no proof that's scientific that can be offered using uh, our natural equipment. It's rather something that we believe upon Christ's testimony. But its contents... Um, do have, uh, well, it's pulling from our philosophical knowledge bank, relative names being among them. So, um, but as I say, as you come to hear and digest and do justice to what Christ has said, namely God is Father, Son, and so on, um, really all the philosophical tools, and I don't think I'm exaggerating that you need Uh, to adequately do justice to those relative names are just the proper concept of relation being towardsness and this idea that relations always come in pairs. It takes two to tango the golden rule of relations. Um, With only those, we should be able to get everything we need to get to uh, speak after God as what he has said in Holy Scripture. And that, of course, is the goal when it comes to the doctrine of the Trinity. Great. Well, thanks, Ryan. I'm looking forward to finally uh, getting into Trinity. That's what we've been, uh, at least that's what I've been keeping my eye on. It's part of the fun of doing all of the uh, uh, speaking of uh, God, the one God. Mm -hmm. And now we are, we have some tools to handle one of uh, historically uh, one of the most difficult doctrines, right? uh, Mm -hmm. There's been much, blood and uh, ink spilt over over this yeah. Yeah. and perhaps some of some of that blood and ink could have been avoided if uh, mm-hmm. we had just gone in the right order but you know ecclesial politics constantine there's you know there's other factors uh here in theology we're in the quiet of our study trying to uh examine these things and i hope that you guys will continue on uh, with us in our mm-hmm. uh, journey as we do that all right Until next time, keep on reading.